And welcome everyone to another Smart Money Circle episode. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Dr. Lynn Kirkpatrick, who's the CEO of Insights Biosciences. And I'm very excited to hear, Dr. Lynn, everything you've done, everything you have going on. Thank you for taking the time and welcome to the Smart Money Circle. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, really, going back to the beginning, I've spent my entire career in drug discovery and development, first in academia. And then I moved into biotech in order to actually clinically develop some of the products I discovered. <clears throat> I uh, shifted to working with Ensize after I took my first company public through an acquisition and had a positive exit, happy to say. And currently, Ensize is working with its technology tap and MPAR through that we acquired through an acquisition as well. And we're really focusing on launching what we believe is an entirely new class of opioid products using that technology platform. I love it. So. Uh, one more thing, everybody who's watching, ticker symbol is ENSC, you trade on the NASDAQ. Uh, Dr. Lynn, please let us know a little about your company and competitive advantages and everything else you want to share about it. Great. Well, yes, we believe using our, our really our top platform sets us away. And as I said, we're trying to uh, position ourselves as having an entirely unique type of opioid pain product. As you know, opioids have been used for thousands of years. They're the only effective medication for severe pain, but they come with problems. Um, obviously the addiction and the abuse that's occurred for the last few decades, and there's been attempts through what were known as the abuse deterrent formulations. They said, we're gonna solve that problem. And that as a class of opioids has not happened. How do you develop a new class of products when you've had these issues? Well, we use what we call clever chemistry. Our TAP opioids are chemically modified opioids. They're inactive until you swallow them. And when you swallow them, they're exposed to an enzyme that you, everybody has in their body. It's called trypsin, and that's where the T from TAP comes from, trypsin activated abuse protection. This category or this enzyme starts uh, the activation process. It recognizes the chemistry we've added to an opioid. It cleaves that off. And then over time, through our chemistry, we're able to control the rate of release of the opioid. You have to swallow it. You can't snort it. You can't inject it. You can't chew it to make it work faster. In fact, you can actually dissolve it in a glass of water and still it has these abuse deterrent properties as they're called. So we are, uh, we've got a number of these products in development. Our lead, which we call PF614, is a TAP modified oxycodone, entirely same class as Oxy Oxycontin from Purdue or Extamsa from Collegium, but those are formulations and people can get around the formulation. The formulation really is a physical means. If you crush it, if you dissolve it in water, you can get the opioid out. With our tap chemistry, as I said, you have to swallow it first. And we're poised to enter phase three. We believe with what we have is a safer product, a product with clinical develop, uh, benefits as well, longer half-life, and we've been recognized from the, by the National Institute on Drug Abuse that have supported our work through funding, as well as the FDA has given us fast track, as well as breakthrough therapy designation. Something unheard of for an opioid product. I love that. So you're dealing, the big problem here is pain. And most people traditionally, just to give some background, used opioids. They've been going back, I see on your website, the 3400 BC was when they first discovered. And recently in the 90s, specifically, there was all this, a lot of news about it because people were using it the wrong way. They were basically overdosing and they became addicted. So there was the pain relief element, but really it became abuse and then as a narcotic and became just a problem. And then there was an uproar. And what you're doing now to help, if I understand correctly, is you've created the TAP, which is that 
trips and activated abuse protection where you can actually get the benefits of the the anti-pain for lack of a better word but you're able to address, help alleviate the pain without the addiction component is that correct well, I, I won't say addiction. As you know, some people, when they use opioids, whether it's coming from our product or another product, have may have a potency for addiction. We don't know who those people are, but it's the people who like the recreational aspects of opioids. They like to get high. They like to abuse them because they also make you feel euphoric. Got now, it. what we've done with our chemistry is be able to meter out the opioid. As I said, you have to swallow it. You can't snort it to make it work faster or inject it, which is a mode of abuse. And with our chemistry, we've also been able to make our product last longer. So giving twice a day pain relief with a, what's called a true 12 hour half-life. So even though other products on the market are marketed as twice a day, people find they're not lasting twice a day. They get into pain, they start self-medicating, and this is another aspect that leads to some of the abuse. So our product, pure 12-hour half-life, you can take it twice a day, uh, modify that pain over the period of 24 hours, and potentially reduce the pain so you can transition off of opioids and get your life back. Now we know there's millions waking up with chronic pain and these individuals recently have been hampered from getting their prescriptions because of the restrictions being placed on opioids. So this is really where we have our dueling crisis. We have those who need pain medication and those abusing pain medication, and it's become this real uh, conflict in the industry, both for prescribers and all this media. People are scared of taping, taking opioids when they actually should be taking them so that they can address their pain and move off pain relievers entirely. Wow, that's fantastic. So I guess it's not addiction, but it's anti-overdose. Is that a better way of... We we have both anti-abuse, okay. but you're correct, which I haven't talked about. Our MPAR technology is a combination of a TAP opioid with a little bit of trypsin inhibitor, which sounds a little counterintuitive, but... With this particular product, we have demonstrated if you take your prescription, one or two pills or capsules, the opioid is released, you get your pain relief, you don't have any problem. If you forgot you've taken them and take two doses, or if somebody gets into the medicine cabinet and takes a whole bunch trying to get high, the more you take, the more inhibitor you get, it blocks that trypsin that I said we need to activate to release the opioid, the material passes out of the body. And yes, we now have an op opioid with overdose protection I and industry that. first. Yeah. yeah. That's really powerful. One more question for you, and then we can move forward. Uh, I know you do some work with ADHD as well. Can you speak to that if at all possible? Or am I? Well, as I said, we have this chemistry platform, trips and activated abuse protection and MPAR. And we can apply that to a number of different products. We've applied it to ADHD products and shown we can deliver these with both extended and immediate release, trips and activated protective properties so that we can prevent some of the abuse that's happening with that category. We're also working in the opioid use disorder category. And we've looked at other drugs that may need delivery potentially to the intestine where, where trypsin is. Drugs working locally there. Uh, we can use TAP to make something that's injectable, maybe an oral product. We can use our chemistry in many different ways. Um, and 
as I said, we've applied it to ADHD. We're not clinically developing these products at this point in time, but we have that in our pipeline. And as we move through phase three with our lead product, we'll be looking at uh, picking up other products from our pipeline to move clinically as well. Wow, that's really, really powerful. Uh, beautiful. Well, Dr. Lynn, next question for you is about risk management. How do you handle risk? I mean, clearly it's a major thing in life and especially in your in your world. And uh, what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management? Risk. Well, we couldn't have moved into a more risky category when you talk about opioids. It's obviously risk in, in biotech comes in many different ways, obviously in your employees, in your finances, and in your uh, product. So certainly in a category um, for drug development, you want to obviously use your strengths, but move into an area which you understand. And um, in the opioid space, we had an opportunity because there was this ter tremendous need. And there was a lot of companies that moved in at the same time, but they were all using the same formulate approach as OxyContin and the drugs on the market. So they really couldn't tell which was a better mousetrap. We mitigated that risk by using an entirely new approach, our chemical approach. And that's where we get the uniqueness. Um, other aspects of risk, obviously financial risk. Uh, we have, I've kept my team very small, focused and experts in their area. That way we keep our burn rate low, we're able to put our money into our resources and our clinical development. Um, so we're not expanding too quickly. And, and thirdly, we're small. So we're also uh, talking to individuals and partners that may assist us in the end of getting across the goal line. Got it. So and that's actually really interesting. So you look at risk, not from one layer, but you look at multiple le levels of risk and from multi, ang I guess, a lot of different angles, if that's a good way of summarizing. Well, absolutely. And, you know, it's not like we don't make mistakes, <laughs> but we try, as I said, we, I try to surround myself with uh, experts in the field where I don't have the expertise. And I must say, I've put together a, an excellent team it's small, uh, focused, but able to, to guide us as needed. And it's working well. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right. Next question for you. Timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience, please. Um, I think the biggest lesson I've learned is understand what you don't know. Uh, as I said, I've surrounded myself with people who have educated me. I started in academia. I wasn't an entrepreneur at the time. You, I found that not only do you have to have solid science, but you have to understand the regulatory environment, the financial environment, the legal environment, the, the intellectual property environment, and uh, learning along the ways I've been able to identify individuals, not only to educate me, but work with me. And really that, I think has been the biggest strength of being able to move nimbly as well as reduce that risk, as you say. I love it. And how about timeless mistakes you've learned along the way, you've made, you've learned, how do you learn from them? How do you avoid making them? Um, two areas where big mistakes, hiring mistakes, um, although you feel you've done your uh, job in due diligence, evaluating. Uh, yeah, I've made some poor hires. Uh, fortunately, I've been able to deal with those. Um, and financial mistakes. Um, you know, as you're when you're a small company and you need financing, you have to understand where the dollars are coming from, what strings are attached, and how that's going to position you going forward. So I, I would say those have been my biggest mistakes. We're still working through some of those, but um, 
again, it's it's learning as you go to understand all of the nuances, not only with uh, individuals on your team, but also what consequence does it have for your company as you strike, whether it's a partnering deal, a financial deal, or whatever type of contract that you're executing. You have to be able to understand what you're signing that's we're all human we all make mistakes but the ability to deal with those mistakes is is massive it's something i've learned it's a common thread in a lot of the guests on the show next question for you as a ceo as a leader moving from academia to business what are some lessons you've learned about leadership what makes a great leader anything that you want to speak on that topic please well i i think i've been successful um i can't really put my finger on being a great leader, sometimes you have to make tough decisions. Sometimes you have to make unpopular decisions. Um, and I would say I have a very close relationship with my management team. I allow people to be able to do their job, express their opinions, and discuss directions we have to go. But in the end, you know, it all comes down to making that decision. And sometimes it's not agreed upon, but fortunately it, we haven't had too many bad ones so far. But really, I, I think that is listen to the advice you're getting and then act on it as you feel you have to. I love it. And how about adversity and obstacles? What adversity have you had to overcome in your journey and how do you handle obstacles when they show up? Um, you know, fortunately, based on our science, um, our current technology has worked seamlessly through non-clinical development or in the animal studies we've done, but also in our human studies, actually much greater than I would have ever anticipated. But I, I have been in in my first company, which is in the oncology space, when the science, once you get into the clinic, maybe doesn't work exactly as it has in animals. And then you have the big decision, do you kill a project, do you keep going? Um, though Those are really tough decisions. Well, fortunately, right now, everything we've done clinically has surpassed my expectation. Um, so much so that, um, as I said, we receive breakthrough therapy from the FDA because how unique our product is and what benefit it actually will give patients in the opioid space. So I would say, it, you know, adversity comes in many ways, scientifically, financially, um, and, and management-wise, but being able to overcome that with, you know, either pivoting or um, moving into broadening your offerings is one way to overcome that. I love it. And then final question for you, what is the best piece of advice you'd like to give the audience or your 30 year old self? Wow, um, <laughs> certainly. Um, as I said, I've learned a lot over the years. Starting in academia, my passion was always to make drugs, uh, understand how to deliver something to a patient. And um, now, after you have been in this space, as I mentioned, uh, I learned along the way, probably maybe had I started this knowing more than I did at the time, I might not have. But um, it really, it, it's following your passion. And my passion is always to be make new drugs, learn as you go, and, and hopefully get across the goal line. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lin. This has been absolutely fantastic. Congratulations on everything. The FDA Fast Track is excellent. Hopefully, we'll have you on again soon to learn more. And people can learn more by going to your website. Is that correct? Absolutely. And I, I hope to come back on and tell you we've launched our new drugs. Uh, I look forward to it. And I'll have the website in the description for everyone to click on. And thank right. you so much. Thanks so much, Adam.